Well, happy Wednesday. Today is my birthday, March 20th, and I have the pleasure of talking to Michael Cardoza. He's an amazing attorney. He's personally tried over a thousand cases and he's taken more than 250 cases to trial. And I've been blessed to watch him a couple times. Unbelievable. Mr. Cardoza has litigated some of the toughest cases in the country and he's gained nationwide traction with media coverage, CNBC, Court TV, KNTV, KTVU, to name a few. So today I want to welcome Michael Cardoza. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I was wondering who you were talking about there for a second. I, I don't tend to believe my own uh, uh, advertisement in the sense of, yeah, I've done a lot of that. And it's been a wonderful trip for me. And I've been awfully lucky, lucky to be involved with a lot of the cases that uh, I've been able to defend people in criminal cases and in a lot of the civil cases uh, that we've done. So I, so far, I'm happy with my career. I know it's coming to an end. And people keep asking me, when are you getting out, man? And I keep saying, wait a minute. You know, I don't golf. I don't play tennis. I'm getting older. I don't work out the way I used to. So I'm wondering what I'm going to do with my time. So I'm going to stick it out a little longer. Well, I like I like the smirk in your face. I get the feeling you still like you like the the game. You like winning. You like doing what you do best. Well, you know, when you talk about winning, yeah, I do like to win. We all like to win. Right. Yeah. But like I've taught my kids, and I've got four of them. Uh, all it takes is all you got. There's always going to be somebody bigger stronger, smarter, but what you want to do with it, whatever skills you were born with, you want to make them the best you can and uh, use them, work hard with your skills, understanding there are going to be times that you're going to lose. And uh, I also tell my kids, you know, a measure of a man is not how you are or how you act when you win, it's how you act when you lose. Do you pick <laughs> yourself up out of the dirt? Do you get back to it and work as hard, or do you just give up? That's the measure of a man. Well, I I I could agree woman. more. And uh, yeah, I've dusted off a few and got back up, so I get it. I know you have. My whole I thing is, have. I can't fail if I don't quit. And here you are, still running wide open, like you're 30 years old. So bravo. Hey, I think our viewers would love to hear the beginning of your legal journey. What sparked your interest in law? Well, uh, first of all, you know, I went to law school and it was one of those thoughts that, well, when I graduate, uh, my career will be directed by where I get a job. You know, will it be in civil? Will it be in criminal? But as I went through law school, I was blessed to have a great evidence professor um, that really motivated me and shunted me down the road of jury trial because it's one of those when you see a great mentor, you go, you know what? I want to be like him. I want to do what he did. But in fact, I want to do more than he did. And I remember telling myself in law school that one time <laughs> I'm laughing because most people won't understand this because of age. Uh, there was none of this. Um, videos that we have now and the instantaneous gratification of our cell phones. But I remember seeing criminal cases on what they called above the fold in a newspaper. And if any of you remember newspapers, uh, they were folded in half. And then you'd have the headlines at the top. And I always thought, you know, I want to do cases that are at top of the fold. And now, you know, it's matriculated into all the videos and all the magic we do today, half of which I don't understand. <laughs> and I have to get young people to come in and go, wait a minute, how you do this? Show me how you right. do this. And they can do it in a second. It'd take me 10 hours to figure it out. Heck, I can't, I laugh. Uh, on, on my car, I've got that video screen and I'm like, damn, why can't they just put a knob there so I can turn the radio on? All I want to do is listen. to, And it's I must have listened to a bunch of tapes on video on YouTube. How, how do you run this thing? 
And I'm like, hey, how do I turn my radio on? That's all I want to know. So the world's really been different for me. And I've tried to keep up with it. And at my age, people my age always go, you know about that? I go, yeah, I've got to know about part of that, at least. So the world really has changed. You remember microwaves got so complicated, we just want to dial, turn it on for a minute. It's the same kind of thing. Just want to turn up the radio. I get it. Totally makes sense. Yeah, um, used to be easy. <laughs> so I think I remember first meeting you at Mr. Fremont. You were, I think, around 40 years old. You were in the Masters. I think you won. So can you tell me, you have this awesome law career, and then you go in and win bodybuilding show. What sparked that? Well, you know what was interesting about that? Uh, I always knew when I got into trial law, and trial law is really, really difficult and stressful. And when I first started to do it, I'd been lifting before and always worked out through college and law school. But I thought as I, you know, started to really try murder cases and really high profile things. I noticed attorneys would get tired in the afternoon and sort of fade. And I thought, man, I don't want to be, you know, do that. I got to be bright and alert and, you know, to be able to do my job and working out certainly did that. And that's why I really put the push on when I, and I was a district attorney at that time, prosecuting cases. I thought, I better get in really good shape so I can last till 4.30, 5 o'clock. And parenthetically, and I know a lot of people, if they're in law enforcement or courts, may not remember this. But long ago, courts would go way beyond 4.30. Now they have to cut it off at 4.30. Right. I remember taking verdicts literally at midnight and judges going, and they were, you know, rather dictatorial. We are going to go on. Yes, it's six o'clock, but we can finish this case. You'd finish. You'd argue at eight or nine at night. And maybe you get a verdict by midnight or one. So again, those things have changed in the courtroom. But those were the things that motivated me to get in shape because I noticed it was either get in shape or start drinking because a <laughs> lot of attorneys went to the bottle and, uh, you know, got their comfort from that. And I got, I want to do that. You know? So I started to lift. And as I lifted, I remember at one time I thought, well, I'll get a, uh, a trainer just to see what they can teach me. And I got this wonderful trainer, Chris Brooks, and uh, she started to train me and taught me an awful lot, you know, little techniques and you know, you don't have to pump the heaviest weight in the gym. Technique is more important. Don't worry. Set your ego at the door. You don't have to be the biggest, strongest. And, you know, I'd watch people, and you've seen it, where guys would bench press and bring 400 pounds or, you know, whatever heavy right. weight down about a half inch and then push it back up and go, hey, I just benched 400. And it's like, hey, <laughs> you moved it a half an inch. Right, right, you know? yeah. So um, I uh, decided to get in shape. And as I did that, and she got me in really good shape, she said, why don't you compete? And I said, no, I'm not getting up on stage and doing that. <laughs> and she actually talked me into it and said, don't be, you know, 50, 60 years old and be one of those. I wonder if I could have, should have, or would have done something. So I said, all right, I'll compete. And I got lucky because I was so disciplined in my diet. I was so cut. I, I won a couple of things. And so I pushed it a little. And then finally, after 10 years, got out of it. I have to, I have to giggle a little bit, Mr. Cardoza. You're not lucky at anything. You apply yourself and you go for it. And it's not an accident. And I have to comment on one thing. I saw you do a trial once and you had a way of charming the other side when they were kind of implicating themselves you had the jury laughing and i thought man you're like a showman and you just said it because i've seen a lot of attorneys that they let themselves go and i think if they can't take care of themselves how are they going to take care of the case and you, you they just get sloppy so I, I, you said it really well and i was going to ask you did working out help your win loss and you've said that it's absolutely amazing um what is your win loss ratio? Is that something you can say? That's I don't even know what it is, Bill, because 
when people ask that. Is you it know, a silly question? They, they, it's no, it's a question that's like you're all going to lose trials, right? I right. I mean, it depends. It depends on the evidence that you okay. have. Okay. Okay. I mean, if I've got a video, you're the DA, and you got a video of my client shooting somebody straight on. You know, am I going to win or lose that case? Probably lose it. But my job is to get my clients the best deal they can. Right. I've been okay. lucky okay. in my wins, and district attorneys win an awful lot because they have a lot of evidence on their side. But our job as defense attorneys is to put them to the task of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that someone's guilty and making sure they don't overstep their power. I mean, they, you know, some of them think, yeah, I got to do this and yeah, let's put them in jail forever. That's why you want to protect people. So when I hear win-loss, if you ever hear an attorney say, you know, I never lost a case. Number one, they're either lying to you right. or two, they've never tried a case or maybe they've tried one or two and got lucky. Right, so right. winning and losing doesn't mean a lot to me. And when I ask inside, I sort of giggle and go, hey, you want somebody that's going to lie to you? Go down the street. They'll even do it cheaper. But I analogize that to like heart surgery. I go, OK, you're looking for someone that can do the job and maybe protect you in that courtroom or do you want cheap? So, like, if you have a heart attack, who asks the surgeon, "Hey, excuse me, <laughs> can I get to charge me for this surgery?" Right, right. You no. Know? So you shop how much a surgeon's going to charge. Doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, what was your best win? You know that that's difficult. There've been enough of them, but there was a murder case that I tried. I'm not going to tell you where. Uh, or what it was about, but it was a very difficult case. And I think I was the proudest of it because at the end of the trial, the jury brought back a not guilty verdict and it was a death penalty case. So they're far and few between. And uh, I'm blowing smoke in my ear now, but the judge told me that it was the best closing argument he'd ever heard in his over 25 years of being a judge. So you know, I, I take that in, I believe it, but I try and not let it affect my head and go, you know, I remind myself, hey, next time you walk in, you could get your little booty kick. Don't get cocky. I uh I have always admired you. You're you are a rock star, but you've always maintained and been grounded. You're a great father and you're very humble. And that inspires me. So Scott Peterson. Um, he was the freak of nature that had a mistress and then did bad things with his wife and pregnant baby. And understand you had an opportunity to interview him once. Can you give us a couple highlights on that? Well, what I can tell you about Scott Peterson, I mean, keep in mind, he's coming up again. The Innocence Project in L.A. has taken up his case. Uh, I got involved in the case because uh, CNN Larry King asked me to be on their show and be a legal comment tater on the show, which I, you know, did for four or five years for him on that case and other cases. Um, Peterson was interesting. I've always said he did not get a fair trial. Everybody goes crazy on that. I'm not saying whether he's guilty or not guilty. I am saying I didn't like the way the trial opened up and what happened. You start with the change of venue. They're, they're in Modesto. That's, the, what's it, 80 miles from the Bay Area? We get right, the news, yeah. they get our news. Everybody knew about Scott Peterson and NorCal, Southern Cal. People knew, yeah, isn't that the guy that killed who? Oh, yeah, his wife, and was she pregnant? So when he, when he, the Supreme Court justice that made a decision where to move it, made that decision, I thought, whoa, that's too close. And then when it got there, there I could go on for hours, but the jury, the way the jury uh, was constructed, the people that were let go on the jury, everything that happened, you had strawberry shortcake, the blonde, you've all heard, well, not all, but some have heard of her, Michelle, Michelle Niece. It was just crazy. And you had the crowds outside cheering and yelling, affecting the jury. And I, I will leave Scott with this. Think if you're on that jury and you've got, I mean, literally hundreds of people outside that courtroom and they would cheer at times when they would hear things happen in the courtroom. 
you're living in San Mateo County. You can bring back a not guilty, maybe hang the jury or find this guy not guilty. Yeah. You no, couldn't live sense. in San Mateo. That's why I thought it should have been moved. I know you want to know whether I think not you, but your audience want to <laughs> think, hey, come on, tell us whether he was guilty or not. I have no idea. Jury found him guilty. I believe in juries. Um, they asked me near the end of the trial to cross-examine him in a mock cross. I prepared for it. We were in there a time. I walked out. I was not really part of their team. I didn't prepare him or try to help him. I cannot tell you about the cross, but say that he, after the cross, they made a decision that he should not testify. So we'll see what happens to Scott. I feel my heart goes out to the Rocha family because they've been obviously put through a lot and everybody right. is so sure that Scott is innocent. And I remember there was a guy named Bertrand Russell who was a um, thinker, a philosopher, and he said the worst evil one man can do against another man is to be so sure of something that right. in fact turns out not to be true. Right. And when I hear everybody go, I know he's 100% guilty, but I go, whoa, okay, I get it. A jury found him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But how can you be so damn sure about something? I'm, you know, I don't know what happened. I don't know whether he did it, he didn't. All I commented was on the trial. So go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, thank you for your perspective of that. I appreciate that. Um, how old are you? I can't hear you. <laughs> I got to say you look great. Okay. Okay, I'll go really, I'll go with that and suggest. Let, let me just those, say you look get fantastic. those glasses checked. And okay. my viewers they won't believe me if you said it. So I'll just leave it be, but it is what it is. Okay, thank you. You better leave How do it you be. how do you maintain a schedule of trials and and this crazy and and your fitness? How do you do it? Couple pointers. You know, I, I guess if I were to give people advice, and I've given this advice to my kids, I have four kids, three boys, I mean, three girls and a boy. And um, first thing I talk to them about is make your bed in the morning. And they go, oh, come on, we're going to make my bed for us. Because that's the first thing you do in a day and you finally got something accomplished. You got your bed made and don't just throw it together. Really make your bed. Now you got to step toward doing something. And then... The other thing, when I competed, even now at times, I'm not as religious because of my age that you brought up, Bill. Uh, but I think it's important that people have prepared food. I mean, like your burritos that you're involved with now. Because I found when I worked out, my appetite became voracious. I would eat anything in sight. And if I got home and there was no food, I'd grab the nearest food source. If it was a box of candy, I'd devour the box of candy. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I just worked out. You know, if it was cereal, I'd eat that. Whatever was, you know, available. So I suggest to people, pre-make your food. Have it there so when you become ravenous, you just start eating that pre-made food so you're not eating crap, uh, you know, like I used to at times. Um when it comes to working out, if I don't have time, you know, it's always a choice between whether you're going to do your cardio or lifting. You always want to do them both. But I was always taught if you're in a hurry, you don't have time, get that cardio done first. Kick the weight lift into the curb. You can always do that. And then I would tell people I learned it in a gym. Um, I was lucky enough to meet a guy by the name of Norman Marks in Oakland, who was Jack LaLanne. Yeah, who's Jack LaLanne? Look it up, Jack LaLanne. Norman. A uh, workout partner, and he used to be absolutely insane. There were insane workouts. I know you worked out with him a couple of times, Bill. Yeah. And uh, he would always tell me 90% of working out is getting to the gym. That's 90% right, right. of it. The other 10% is easy. What the heck? I'm here. You know, I may as well, you know, work out, push the weight around, and that's easy. And parenthetically, too, I'd, I'd always laugh. I'd be in trial. I'm going back to the trials now. I'd be leaving the courthouse, and I'd have my gym bag, and somebody say, aren't you tired? And i say, God, I am dead tired. I can hardly walk. I'm so tired. 
Right. They said, what are you going to the gym for? It's because it'll give me energy and I can work a couple more hours later. And they go, come on, you're going to go lift weights, do cardio, and that's going to give you energy? I go, I swear to God, it does. It and does. it does. You go to a gym, you do all that, you're invigorated. Right. And I think the last thing I tell people, and I tell my kids this all the time, be kind to people, be nice. You ain't as good as you think you are, you know? And if you're lucky enough, to be good, be nice about it. Don't be egocentric about it. Do your job. But most of all, be nice to people. Why Why do you have to be an egocentric, you know, whatever? Be kind, be nice. Do, th you know, things for people. People you don't know, be kind to them. They don't have to push them away. So that's pretty much what I've tried to I, live by. Sometimes I, I spurt you. off. I couldn't oh. agree with you more about oh. the kindness. The world right now is so tough, and I, I just... I think people are so consumed. It's it's weird, and people aren't gentle and kind with one another. So that that's awesome. Um, the one last thing I want to ask you is: I think you tried the keto burritos. What do you think? Now it's your time to get me back, Cardo. <laughs> you know, I, I I like them. I I like the fact that they were pre made. I devoured one of them because I happened to have worked out, and I go, "Oh, that's right, I got one of bills." I just went. <laughs> so. You know, to say that I tasted it <laughs> is a, a bit of a misnomer because I devoured it. But the second one I had, it was good. Good. And I've got them. I've got them ready to go. So when I do work out or when I'm at work here and I get hungry, I don't go in the kitchen because, like a lot of offices, you get a lot of cake, candy, all that kind of stuff there, and that's easy to eat if there's nothing. So I've got those in the refrigerator ready to go. Last thing I'm going to ask you with is. Just your kind of opinion. You've got half the population is obese. Another 30% are fat. So you got 80% of the population cannot take care of themselves. Yet a high percentage of kids have diabetes now. And is it fair for the parents to give their kids bad habits so the kids are dying young? What's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I'm not blaming anybody. I mean, and especially the kids that are raised by parents that weren't lucky enough to pick up the kind of habits that we picked up. So I think the best we can do is educate people. But okay. there are people that, you know, don't care. And okay, I mean, how are you going to change that? It's going to cost us a lot. They can only get there. I know there's some new drug out of Zempic or something that everybody's taking to lose weight. It's not for that. But, you know, people look for the easy way you out. They sure do. You sure know, do. And, it's um, like, hey, it's like you and I have talked before and a lot of the lifters I've lifted with. It's really easy. We're like a car. You put gas in. If you don't use it all, it's still in your tank. Well, if you put food in and you don't work it off, it, there it is on your hips. That's a good your, analogy. That's good on analogy. your legs. So yeah. don't put so much gas in your car. And it's, you know, it's difficult. I find that that intermittent diet, I know, a lot of people do, and I find that to be really simple. You know, don't eat for 12, 16 hours, and eight of it sleeping usually if you sleep that much. So what's, what's hard about it? Then you don't but have you, to worry about You know, about you just hit the nail on the head. It is very, it's actually easier than people think. You do intermittent fasting. You change a creamer to a, you change a couple little things, and you yeah. can do what you want, but people think it's this huge project, and you just said it. Yeah. It couldn't be any easier than imminent fasting. Anyway, I want to well, thank you so much, Cardoza, Michael, for the time today and the transparency. And I really appreciate the blessing of your time. All right, but happy birthday to you. You take care of yourself and don't celebrate too much. Thank you, and, Cardoza. Uh,